Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi there and welcome to our webinar. Uh, this program is part of CSG's eAcademy series, a bi-monthly webinar series designed to provide information and training on the most critical issues facing state leaders, including the latest trends in state policy making and cutting edge state solutions. My name is Jennifer Burnett and I'm the Fiscal and Economic Development Policy Analyst here at the Council of State Governments. Today's program is the final of our four-part series designed to give state policymakers a basic and solid understanding of risk management in insurance and how insurance affects policy decisions. CSG, CSG has been excited to partner with the Griffith Insurance Education Foundation on this webinar and a series of other events over the last year and a half on insurance-related issues. We've worked closely with Frank Paul Tomasello, Program Director at the Griffith Foundation and affiliate of the Institute, to bring you these programs. Frank and I will be moderating today's program. I'm just going to call on him to say a few words about our collaboration. Frank? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the Griffith Foundation is pleased to collaborate with CSG. Our organizations share similar missions, which include a commitment to a nonpartisan, non-advocative, and academic approach to programming. And this shared commitment really is the foundation upon which our relationship is built. It informs our approach to collaborative programming. It enables us to provide an opportunity for public policymakers to gain unbiased knowledge about risk management and insurance. Uh, before I introduce today's presenter, let me send it back to you, Jennifer, to cover logistics for the webinar. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, so just briefly about uh, webinar logistics. First of all, this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything, um, you can find a recording of it on CSG's website, the Knowledge Center, csg.org forward slash Knowledge Center. That should be available in the next couple of days on our website. Next, um, we welcome questions from the audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask any question at any time, just type it into the dialog box in the GoToWebinar interface on your screen there, and we'll make sure that our speaker sees it and uh, or, or we ask the question for them. Uh, now back to uh, Frank Tomasello to introduce our speaker and to get things started for the day. Thanks, Jennifer. We're pleased to be joined today by Dr. David T. Russell, Professor of Insurance and Finance at California State University, Northridge. Uh, Professor Russell holds an A.B. in Economics from Amherst College and M.A. and Ph.D. degrees in Insurance and Risk Management from the Wharton School the University of Pennsylvania. To learn more about his accomplishments and academic interests, we invite you to visit the CSUN website at www.csun.edu. Finance. In the hour ahead, Dr. Russell will discuss the underpinnings of insurance regulation and legislation, using emerging issues as a lens through which to examine these topics. Dr. Russell, as I turn the microphone over to you, let me open the conversation with a question that goes to the impact of technological advancements on the insurance market and, by extension, on public policymakers. We've all heard about recent technological developments with autonomous vehicles including Tesla's announcement just last week that all of their newly produced cars are fully capable of driving themselves right now. What do self-driving cars mean for the auto insurance marketplace as well as public policymakers? Thanks for, thanks for the question, Frank, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, the auto insurance market is, is a, a, on one glance, is a very sleepy market. On the other hand, with both uh, autonomous vehicles and a lot more people on the roads these days with cheap gas and uh, higher employment levels. It's a, it's a very dynamic marketplace. As we look into the future with self-driving cars, um, most auto insurers see the issue regarding liability, which is what most states require, of being one that the manufacturer will bear. So. We're going to be in this transitional period for the next oh, 10 to 15 years as people use the cars that they have that are not self-driving and more and more cars appear on the road that are autonomous. And those manufacturers are going to assume some liability for the software and the hardware that operates the vehicle. So who is actually liable for an accident in an autonomous vehicle uh, event? Um, is going to be something that regulators as well as manufacturers 
wrestle with over that transitional period. And then, um, say, 15 to 20 years from now, as most, if not all, cars become self-driving, if, if you can contemplate such a world, that's something the regulators will have some time to prepare with um, their uh, legislative staffs and, and um, uh, you know, interacting with other regulators to come up with a comprehensive strategy through what, what we know is the NAIC. So today we're going to talk about insurance regulation and legislation. At first, um, at first glance, this may not be the most exciting topic for, for some people. On the other hand, I think most of you by the end of the webinar will find that this is an area that covers virtually every area of financial services and risk management for consumers and businesses. And this is something state governments, uh, since insurance is regulated at the state level, need to be aware of. And I actually believe that uh, legislation and regulation are very interesting topics. So let's, let's move forward and look at an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So insurance regulation is uh, not governed by, but it's guided by an organization called the NAIC, and we'll talk about that in a bit. We'll also talk about what insurance regulators actually do. We'll talk about some state government insurance programs, that is, uh, uh, state insurance companies that are quasi-public and sometimes quasi-private organizations. We'll talk about how regulators um, govern market conduct and look at uh, solvency, which is the ability of insurance companies to meet their obligations. We'll talk about rates and forms, something that uh, impacts every consumer and every business. We'll talk about how insurance companies get permission to operate through the use of licensing. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about insurance fraud and its p impact on Next slide. So insurance is regulated at the state level, and insurance companies um, have to comply with 51 different jurisdictions if you include the District of Columbia. And to keep insurance regulation fairly uniform, there is a, a, a governing body that gathers all insurance commissioners together called the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And this gives uh, each state the ability to take uh, nuggets and, and knowledge from all of the other states and bring it back to their own state in which, so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time that uh, uh, something needs to be done. So they regulate uh, how insurance companies get started, how they're financed. They also provide um, governance uh, and ideas about what the policy forms look like, licensing. But keep in mind, insurance um, commissioners take this back to their own states um, to make their own regulation. The NAIC does not make laws. It does not um, regulate. It's merely a, uh, you might think of it as a trade association that uh, helps insurance commissioners look at what they're doing. Next slide. So in the context of the NAIC, states work together to make sure that the insurance regulations look fairly similar. In fact, they draft model laws and leave the state uh, identification blank so that legislatures can adopt something that insurance professionals have already uh, vetted and worked out the language for. So because there are tight budgets and uh, there's a, a lack of bench strength at, at, at every state, um, the NAIC provides states with comfort that their own regulations won't differ too much from a, a neighboring state or a state across the country. As I mentioned earlier, the NAIC has no ability to regulate insurance directly, but they give a lot of guidance to each state regulator so that when the states make their own laws, they have a pretty good idea that uh, an organization 
um, that has the depth and the, the bench strength can um, you know, craft uh, the, the right laws with the right legal language and that states can to some degree wave most of it on through. If they want to put their own spin on a regulation they're certainly free to do that and in some states such as here in California unique needs such as the earthquake market may require a, a quite a radically different approach than, than that of a neighboring state. Next slide. So what do insurance regulators do? Regulators are given authority by state law and they are responsible for enforcing the laws passed by legislators. Next slide. That includes policy forms and this is the document that most consumers receive in the mail when they buy an insurance policy but don't necessarily read. They also review rate filings and hold hearings to determine whether or not a rate increase or a rate decrease requested by an insurance company is legitimate. Um, many consumers and many states are not comfortable with a completely free market for insurance which is oftentimes a required product. Therefore, most states um, regulate r rates and require documentation and supporting evidence before allowing rates to change. They also uh, license new insurance companies. One thing that we enjoy here in the United States is a very robust and competitive insurance market. And so before a new insurance company enters the market, we want to be sure that they are able and ready and um, honest in their dealings before they even get started. Otherwise, we'll have uh, uh, incompetent or um, uh, insolvent or under-supported organizations entering the market, and no, in, no state wants that. They also want to uh, look at um, the licensing of insurance professionals. So insurance professionals such as agents or claims adjusters um, sometimes need to be licensed in a given state so that we know that people are not convicted felons, so that they're uh, held accountable for their actions, and we keep track of who's doing business in a particular state. One of the levers that regulators have over insurance companies and those professionals is uh, investigating policyholder complaints. One of the best sources of intelligence of what's going on in the marketplace is um, word from insurance policyholders that are, are finding that the product they bought was not what they thought or it was somehow misrepresented or it was not performing the way it was advertised. So regulators feel those complaints and, and respond to them. Finally, in the unhappy event that an insurance company runs into hard times because it's either suffered uh, terrible losses or it's been mismanaged, insurance departments of each state can seize or uh, try to rehabilitate an insurance company um, much like the FDIC would do or that bank regulators would do for an insolvent bank. So most po consumers believe that their insurance company will pay and that the check won't bounce, but in the unlikely and unhappy event that that becomes a, a real possibility, insurance regulators can step in. Next slide. Dr. Russell, uh, Frank Tomasello with the Griffith Foundation. As we transition to the next slide, uh, let me jump in and share a question uh, for your uh, thoughts. Sharing economy enterprises like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb have changed how people travel. Um, can you speak to how these innovations affect insurance coverage? And more specifically, can you talk about what impact uh, these may have on insurance department activities? Great question, Frank. Um, I've used Uber repeatedly. I've never had the uh, experience with Airbnb, but some people use that or VRBO. And the share sharing economy introduces additional risk to properties and um, automobile operators. And regulators have had to catch up with uh, how do we view an accident where someone's in an Uber because most people have a personal auto insurance policy and because it's personal it does not 
cover events when you're operating your vehicle for business or for a profit. The same applies to homeowners situations. So regulators have had to step in and uh, in many cases address marketplace innovations such as uh, a, an insurance company that offers an endorsement or an add-on to their policy that might cover certain elements of um, automobile operation or homeowners operation that is not currently covered under the personal policy but may in fact need uh, coverage before uh, Uber's coverage or Airbnb's coverage applies. So this has been what we'll call a gray area of the insurance market and only recently have regulators caught up to um, the sharing economy and insurers ha have led the way because they their policyholders believed that well they have insurance it's covered because they didn't read the policy and they didn't see that um, being a, a renter or, or being a, a livery service is what what Uber is it's not necessarily covered under the auto policy and therefore in order to clarify that um, insurance companies have begun to offer products that will extend the coverage to address these uh, coverage gaps and regulators have had to give their blessing to the uh, these endorsements and therefore um, we're slowly but surely moving in the direction of of a market where both buyers and sellers of insurance understand what they have so what else uh, what else do insurance regulators do. They oftentimes will ask an insurance company or an insurance uh, professional to cease and desist a certain type of activity. Stop selling insurance. Your, your capacity to take, take any more risk has been exhausted or stop representing a life insurance product as a bank deposit because it is, because it is not. So regulators need this regulatory tool to be able to stop activity that's questionable or just plain uh, illegal. They also conduct audits, both field audits and mail audits, to make sure that an insurance company is, in, is complying with regulations and uh, good business practices. Remember, consumers really are unaware of most of the inner workings of an insurance product. Therefore, they um, need action of people who knew, know better, and that would reside in the insurance department. So evaluating solvency information is particularly challenging because the accounting behind insurance product is quite complex. Even accountants who are not familiar with insurance accounting can be baffled by it. Therefore, we need uh, accountants and regulators and actuaries who are familiar with the um, specialized accounting so that they can make sure that an insurance company can meet its obligations which is what the definition of solvency is. They also evaluate market conduct. They will audit files, uh, do undercover investigations, they will um, look at complaints, they will see if there's a theme of uh, over overcharging underpaying on claims. These market conduct exams will also look at sales practices, again, to protect consumers from bad actors or, or even gray areas that may develop as uh, people jockey for economic advantage. And finally, most uh, insurance departments will publish some sort of consumer guide to help insurance companies excuse me, insurance consumers um, pick and choose from amongst the, the very confusing and wide array of insurance offerings such as auto and homeowners. Next slide. So the person that leads the insurance department is called the insurance commissioner. And the insurance commissioner may in fact be called something as the superintendent of insurance or the director of insurance, sometimes the commissioner of insurance. Depending on the state, uh, they can be appointed by the governor. Uh, 
or they can be elected. Um, here in California, uh, since 1988, our insurance commissioner has been elected, but in most states it's an appointment by the governor and sometimes ratified by the Senate. Many have um, obviously political ties or political ambitions, but they usually have some sort of experience or expertise in general business or even in the insurance business since, again, it's a highly specialized and complex field. Next slide. So in addition to regulating the business of insurance, um, state legislatures have authorized the creation of state insurance programs. And these are programs that offer risk transfer mechanisms that for public policy reasons, uh, the legislature wants it to be available. Perhaps it's not being provided by the private market or the private market needs competition that is not currently supplied by that. Next slide. So here are some examples of some of the common um, state insurance programs. One would be workers' comp. This is an enormous market since Every state has workers' comp laws that re require some evidence of uh, ability to pay for worker injuries. Oftentimes, the state will provide an alternative for workers' comp insurance. There's unemployment insurance funds, which we'll talk about. Automobile insurance plans that may s supply insurance to those unable to secure insurance on a, a, an affordable price or at any price. There are particular programs called FAIR plans that we'll talk about in a bit, and some states have exposure to hurricanes, and because the private market may not do a good job of supplying that, um, the states will provide beach or windstorm pools that, that provide windstorm protection. Next slide. So workers' compensation, as I mentioned, is protection uh, against um, injuries and lost wages as a result of a, an accident that occurs while in the uh, scope of employment. In some states, such as Washington State, you have a single provider that is state-run. Other states, uh, such as Wisconsin or California, can have uh, competitive funds that compete with the private market. And then there are residual market plans that are for employers who have trouble securing private coverage because of lost experience or high risk. Next slide. Unemployment insurance is generally a federally supported state program that is not available for private insurers for the, for the primary reason that it can affect everyone all at once. For example, during the Depression, had there been unemployment insurance, it would have wiped out any private insurance company. Therefore, it's generally federally supported by the U.S. Treasury, and during the financial crisis, the unemployment insurance program helped buffer the economy, but it lost a lot of money. So the benefits vary by state, and they're generally dependent on how much someone makes and how long they've worked. But there are minimum federal standards that apply. Next slide. So, as I mentioned earlier, every state requires that its drivers provide some evidence of financial responsibility. Almost everyone uses insurance to meet that financial responsibility. For those that are unable to get that insurance at an affordable price from the private market, states generally provide some mechanism for someone who has a lot of tickets or accidents or has a low cost need for insurance um, to get it from a residual market mechanism, sometimes called the involuntary market. The costs of operating these is, are oftentimes spread across the voluntary market. So if a particular insurance company has 20% of the market, they would be expected to bear 20% of the costs of these programs. And these programs are typically marked marketed or administered by private insurers, but they lose money for the main reason that if you charge a high risk too much money, 
they will simply drop out and drive uninsured. So the state believes, in most cases, that some sort of subsidy from other drivers through private market mechanisms is the, is the best outcome to prevent people from driving uninsured. So therefore, someone who's high risk has a chance at getting somewhat affordable ca uh, coverage as opposed to driving uninsured. Next slide. So we also have something called FAIR plans, and FAIR access to insurance requirements plans allow coverage in areas um, or in markets where the private market simply isn't doing business or doesn't want to. <clears throat> like the residual market in automobile insurance, FAIR times spread the, the costs across all insurers doing business in a state. So in, in urban areas or high-risk areas like a wildfire area, these areas have trouble attracting insurance companies to do business. Therefore, um, they need state help. And in order to provide markets for those people, fair plans develop and private markets um, are propped up by subsidies from the voluntary market. Again, this, this need not be uh, all for urban areas or, or low-income areas. Uh, here in California, we have wildfire areas with very wealthy uh, homeowners who are unable to get insurance, and the fair plans um, help provide uh, a market when, when private insurers don't want to touch that area. Next slide. Dr. Russell, uh, Frank Tomasello with uh, another question here. This raised from a uh, participant. Uh, before I share it with you, uh, let me take a moment to remind our viewers that we welcome their questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Dr. Russell at any time, simply type it into the dialog box in the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll make sure that uh, Dr. Russell sees it. Now to our participant's question. Uh, Dr. Russell, extreme weather doesn't seem to be uncommon anymore whether or not the cause is climate change, how do you see this affecting the auto and homeowners insurance markets and by extension insurance regulators and legislators? Great, great question, Frank. Um, the reinsurance market, which is insurance for insurance companies, is a mechanism through which insurance companies can share risk and spread it worldwide. And that helps one area, such as uh, Texas in the last 18 months, uh, has had terrible experience. But the reason that Texas insurance companies are, are not suffering um, you know, insolvency is because they've purchased reinsurance and regulators have encouraged and mandated in some cases the spreading of risk. Um, because of low interest rates, there's a lot of investment capital out there that is chasing uh, business. And that helps keep uh, risk and rates low for insurance companies. And as we look at extreme weather going forward, there's no doubt that actuaries are keeping an eye on how much um, both the frequency of events and how bad they are, the severity. They're keeping an eye on that and making sure that rates for both homeowners and auto insurance keep up with the cost of claims. So we recently had Hurricane Matthew that um, fortunately in most states turned out to be uh, less costly than expected. However, actuaries and insurance executives are very aware that extreme weather or additional Hurricane Matthews or Superstorm super storm Sandys can come along and push up their losses and that inevitably those losses will end up in the rates of insurance uh, consumers. Should we see a sustained increase in extreme weather, I think we will uh, expect to see continued increases in insurance rates. So moving right Thank along on that, on, thanks. Uh, on that front, no pun intended, on the beach front, and um, in anywhere that's exposed to um, potential weather, mostly on the Gulf Coast or on the, uh, in the southeastern United States, you see beachfront and windstorm plans in areas where 
private insurers don't want to take a, a large amount of exposure. Some insurance companies don't want to write insurance within one mile of the water, and that's because one hurricane can cause such a large amount of damage. Since regulators and legislatures don't, don't want to see uh, those constituents left out of the insurance market, they can create uh, plans that transfer the risk of wind or hurricane to a standalone insurance company and so that the private market uh, functions don't affect people's ability to transact, to, to, to buy and sell property, to get mortgages, and of course to recover from an event. So these plans are generally focused on uh, hurricane prone areas, but they may also um, be uh, provided through fair plans. And again, the idea is that the state wants to make sure that the constituents have access to insurance coverage. Otherwise, the real estate market and, and mortgage market will simply cease to function. Next. Now, as I've mentioned, private insurance companies are, are reluctant to do business in areas where there can be a large uh, concentration of claims uh, a, a, in uh, large amounts and that would threaten their solvency. In the unlikely event that an insurance company runs out of money to pay, there are state guarantee fund associations that help insurance companies um, satisfy their claims as they exit the business. Again, regulators are focused on protecting consumers uh, against uh, insurer mismanagement or insolvency. And these state guarantee funds use money uh, from assessments on other private insurance companies to cover any deficits or shortfalls in the claims payment process. Next. So next, let's talk about uh, market conduct and other regulatory activities such as uh, solvency surveillance. Because uh, insurance consumers, as I mentioned earlier, don't necessarily have the technology or the awareness to evaluate their insurance company or alternative offerings, regulators need to investigate and conduct, uh, conduct uh, occasional audits to make sure that insurers are uh, conducting business in good faith and making sure that their ability to pay is um, as advertised. Next. So I've spoken with many executives who've had market conduct exams and if you can imagine the regulators moving into a conference room and asking for files, um, that's essentially what happens. Uh, regulators come in and ask for claims files and sit down and look through those files and make sure that everything in the file meets state standards and is consistent. If they find an inconsistency or a lack of documentation, then there can be sanctions against the insurance company. The same can happen with agents because agents are generally a sales force that make representations about coverage. Um, there can also be market conduct exams of sales practices. And finally, underwriting is the process of evaluating uh, applications for insurance. If there's a particular type of illegal discrimination going on in the underwriting process, a market conduct exam can uncover that and they oftentimes use statistics or they may use anecdotal evidence that they've uh, gleaned from either um, policyholder complaints or maybe even a, a, a regulator in a, in a neighboring state. Next slide. So what can happen if they find misconduct? They can fine the insurance company, they can suspend the licenses of agents and brokers. The, these levers will compel the insurance company to stop this activity and make it very expensive um, to do business 
in a particular area if they're if they're um, misrepresenting the policy or if they're simply misbehaving. So because it can be so expensive and it can also expose the company to class action lawsuits uh, in addition to regulatory action, most insurance companies really try to conduct business on a good faith basis. Otherwise, it can, it can be very damaging to their business, both from a mon monetary perspective as well as a reputational perspective. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, claims settlements are something that most uh, consumers don't, uh, don't look forward to. It's something bad has happened, and therefore they need money, and they are very uh, conscious of the fact that the claims adjuster oftentimes has vastly more knowledge than they do, and they're worried. They're, they're under stress, and they want to make sure that they get paid in full. Well, regulators are there to help consumers um, both from a, an oversight perspective and if there's a particular um, problem with a, a, a claim settlement from through the complaint resolution process, um, regulators can help pressure insurance companies or persuade them to make sure there are no unnecessary delays, uh, that the policy provisions are clear, that the settlements are fair, not artificially low, and that everything is uh, properly explained. I can tell you in my interactions with claims professionals that most claims people are human beings and they want to pay no more and no less than what they owe. However, it's very helpful for consumers to have the regulatory, uh, shall I say, threat to make sure that things are paid quickly fairly and in full so that the consumer can feel good about the insurance mechanism and uh, the insurance market is operating the way all of us expect it to. Next slide. Well, all of those claims payments have to come from somewhere. They come from the insurer's assets. And contrary to some people's belief, insurance companies do not have infinite amounts of money. They have a lot of money, but it's owed to a lot of different people, both in the present and in the future, because many claims take time to develop. So how do we know if the insurance company has enough money? That's the regulator's job, is to make sure that the insurance company's balance sheet and asset uh, uh, position is sufficient to cover all of its liabilities plus a cushion that insurance regulators call surplus. Without surplus, an insurance company can't meet unexpected demands and needs. So there are certain ratios that are applied to make sure that they can meet their obligations in the present, as well as those obligations that may develop in the coming years. Next slide. Dr. Russell. Uh it's Frank with uh, a question for you. We've heard about lower interest rates for the last few years, uh, prompting this question. How does the trend in interest rates affect the insurance market, and what questions might it present for insurance regulators and legislators? Excellent question. The, the low interest rate environment that we're, we're experiencing um, has sent insurer investment income lower, as you may know, insurance companies get most of their revenue from premiums. However, they also get a lot of revenue from the money that they're investing while they're awaiting claims payout. So in the case of a life insurance policy, money is invested over decades awaiting um, someone's uh, eventual uh, claim payment. And as they calculate the premiums, they're expecting a certain amount of investment income. In recent years, lower interest rates have sent that investment income lower, and therefore insurers face a conundrum. Do they raise rates? Do they cut back on new product offerings? Or do they try to aggress more, uh, invest more aggressively uh, to make up the difference? Regulators are there to oversee these activities 
to make sure that the insurance company doesn't behave in an excessively risky fashion, while at the same time having the, the, the sufficient income to meet the obligations that they've promised well into the future. Thank you, David. So, regulators... <laughs> Quick note, very quickly, we've had a question from the audience that um, whether or not this, a copy of the PowerPoint will be made available, and I just wanted to say it will be made available along with the recording on CSG's website following this presentation. Great. Thanks. So as part of solvency surveillance, uh, regulators and their actuaries um, set certain uh, minimum requirements and they go into the field and do both routine as well as surprise audits to make sure that the assets and liabilities as represented are just that. Many of these valuations are estimates and regulators have one overarching goal to make sure that the promises made by insurance companies can be honored not only under present circumstances but under circumstances of stress and to, to be able to honor uh, a commitment that you've made under stress, you need to have extra money. You have, need to have a cushion that, again, is called surplus. And that um, monitoring takes place by state regulators. So they have certain ratios called iris ratios that are early warning signs of um, deterioration in an insurance company's finances. So using these various ratios, regulators can guide uh, insurance managers and insurance executives towards a result that meets uh, the solvency needs of policyholders. Next slide. So there are certain ratios, as I mentioned, uh, a surplus depending on how much premium is written. So the more policies an insurance company sells, the more surplus they're going to need to meet uh, a hurricane or two hurricanes or three hurricanes. Insurance companies and their regulators conduct stress tests to make sure that they can survive a truly ugly, say, 100-year or 250-year event. And they uh, can withhold a license uh, from an insurance company or issue a cease and desist order to prevent an insurance company from taking more risk when they're already in a uh, stressed situation. These regulations vary by state, and one of the reasons they vary so much is because every state has its own risk profile. In the Midwest, the, the, uh, the weather is different than in the than in the southwestern United States. Um, likewise, uh, different areas have wildfire earthquake exposure as opposed to freezing or hurricane. So states are in, in, encouraged to adopt financial requirements that are uh, prudent uh, in light of all of the uh, risks faced in that state. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, um, market conduct exam or field exams occur on both a routine basis and on an as-needed basis. They generally focus on claims files or financial records, but in either case, the regulator is looking for uh, record keeping, uh, consistency, uh, transparency, and making sure that an insurance company is able and uh, willing to meet its claims obligations as well as a comfortable cushion should something unexpected come along. Next slide. As part of these financial records, there are annual statements that are filed. These are public filings that are accessible on the internet, um, sometimes with a charge, sometimes not, but they're huge voluminous filings that have a lot of uh, data about premiums, lines of business, assets, liabilities, um, where the money is invested. All of these things um, suggest certain management performance and regulators are looking for certain warning signs to make sure that 
in the event that the unexpected happens, will this insurance company be able to honor its obligations? Next slide. So the iris ratios are uh, things that look at uh, assets, liabilities, claims, uh, investment income, trends that help identify any financial problems that may be developing. And these uh, ratios are not perfect. They need to be evaluated in light of a particular insurance company's business. For example, the auto insurance business is different than homeowners. Homeowners insurance is heavily influenced by things like weather, whereas automobile insurance, while impacted by weather, is also affected by gas prices and the number of cars on the road. They, they but different inflation rates uh, for claims. H houses get more expensive, cars have more bells and whistles. All of these things feed through the financial data and the iris ratios help suggest a, a, an early warning mechanism to see if trouble is developing. Is the insurance company charging enough? Um, because it sounds like a good thing that an auto insurer or homeowners insurer would have low premiums. But if they're too low, eventually that, uh, that insurance company is going to have trouble meeting its obligations. So regulators look at these ratios to be sure that what is being charged is appropriate to the risks being taken. Next. So if an insurance company is unable to meet its obligations, it may be placed into sort of a, sustent, uh, a, a, a state of suspense where it stops writing new business and it's rehab, rehabilitated through uh, receivership or under some sort of conservator. So regulators reserve the right to seize an insurance company if it gets into trouble, and this helps prevent the trouble that that insurance company is in from spreading to other insurance companies or, or affecting policyholder payments. Again, the primary goal of regulators is to protect the policyholder that files a claim. You want to know that the money's there to pay it. If, in fact, the company is simply beyond, um, beyond repair, an insurance company a regulator can take that insurance company and dissolve it and assign policies to another insurance company or somehow liquidate it. Next slide. So for, the, for most of us who are consumers, we are very concerned about our insurance rates. We don't often read the policy form, that's the actual contract, but it's the goal of regulators to make sure that consumers are getting a fair price and the coverage that they need because most people are either unable or unwilling to, to actually read the policy. So regulators do read the policy, they make sure it's fairly clear, and they make sure that the consumer is adequately protected. Next slide. So <clears throat> rate regulation it varies by state, but it is oftentimes um, re referred to as a Goldilocks scenario. It's adequate, that is enough and not excessive, that is not too much. So not too hot, not too cold. And it's not supposed to be unfairly discriminatory. So there is discrimination in rate regulation, but not the kind you may be thinking of. So males and females are charged different rates. That's discrimination. But most legislatures have decided that gender-based discrimination in insurance rates, for example, young males versus young females, that is not unfair discrimination. Next. So different states have different approaches to rate regulation. There may be mandatory rate regulation where uh, a across the board increase or decrease is uh, ordered by the insurance department. You also have prior approval states like the one uh, that I live in, in California. You have to get permission to change rates by a certain amount. Um, file and use is a is a mechanism where you file rates and then you begin to use them at some point if the state doesn't object 
use and file, you can start using them right away, but within a certain amount of time, you have to let the state know that you're doing that. Flex rating allows you to raise and lower premiums by a certain amount without uh, requesting any permission. And finally, open competition, uh, which is relatively uncommon, allows insurance companies to charge whatever they want with the philosophy that the market can decide best. Next. So forms regulation, this is the policies themselves, um, is a you know regulation of what the contract contains. Is mold covered? What is excluded? Is war? Is um, uh, freezing pipes? Are these things covered under the policy? Earthquake is, co uh, is covered in some states by endorsement and other states it's not covered at all. Um, it sometimes is a standalone or separate policy. So policy forms govern whether or not uh, specific risks are or are not covered and what's excluded. The reason this is regulated is because most people don't read the policy. Therefore, you have uh, regulators who are looking at this with a fine-tooth comb to make sure there are no exceptions or no confusing provisions that um, present ambiguities or unreasonable uh, exclusions. Next slide. So some states will um, have provisions about how many words are in a particular paragraph, how many syllables are in a, in a, in a word. Uh, does it need to be no more than ninth grade English? So there are uh, very specific requirements of how a policy reads. If it's too complicated and too much legalese, then it may be judged to be unacceptable to the state. Next. So in some cases, the insurance market simply isn't there for a particular risk. For example, uh, you may see at certain, um, uh, uh, certain state fairs or certain um, carnivals a traveling amusement park where the, there's a self-contained merry-go-round in a truck that unfolds at each location. This kind of risk isn't something you walk up to a state farm agent and buy. So there are insurance companies and insurance brokers that will cover hard-to-place risks, and they're called surplus lines brokers. Commercial coverage for very large plants is also difficult or sophisticated um, for people to uh, transact in that market, and therefore it has certain exemptions. Sophisticated buyers and sophisticated sellers of insurance don't need the same sort of regulatory protection that uh, a consumer needs. Therefore, there are exemptions available in those markets. Next. So as I mentioned earlier, because we have a lot of players in the market, we need a lot of oversight over both the insurers themselves and the insurance professionals involved in those markets. Next. So there are three different types of insurance company license. There is a domestic, that's a company that is licensed in that state. There's a foreign uh, license, it sounds like it's out of the country, but in fact it just means it's in another state. And an alien uh, license is from a insurance company that is headquartered in another country. Next. So insurance companies take all kinds of forms. As I mentioned, they can come uh, from out of state, in state, out of the country. They also have different ownership forms. The two primary ownership forms are stocks and mutuals. A stock company is owned by stockholders. It's capitalized and its surplus comes from stockholders who hope that the insurance company does well and that the stockholders profit from that prosperity. It's uh, run by management who is governed by a board of directors. A mutual insurance company and some of the larger insurance companies in the United States are mutual insurance companies. Uh, 
such as Liberty Mutual or State Farm. These are companies that are owned by their customers. You can think of them as cooperatives. And they also are uh, governed by a, a board of directors who selects management. However, the board of directors is elected by the owners, the policyholders. So most people that have a mutual insurance policy don't know that they actually own part of it. It's difficult to conceive of something that you own, but you really can't sell that ownership. Stock ownership, of course, you can sell. A relatively rare form uh, of ownership is the reciprocal, which is much like a mutual. However, it is externally managed by something called an attorney. In Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, some hard to place risks are, are uh, you know, they need insurance from out of the state or even out of the country. So usually an insurance company uh, offers an admitted product. That is, uh, an insurance policy that comes from a company licensed to do business in that state. However, if you're unable to find anyone in that state willing to sell that policy that's licensed in that state, you can go to the non-admitted market. This may come, in fact, from another state or even from Lloyd's of London. You can think of Lloyd's of London as a non-admitted insurer, even though they oftentimes have uh, licenses in, given, in any given state. The non-admitted market is a less regulated market, but one that's very necessary for covering risks that are hard to place. Next. So surplus lines insurance is usually obtained through the non-admitted market. And the nice thing about the surplus lines market is it brings to bear uh, help from out of state or even out of the country on risks that are um, challenging to place or new. Um, in, in some cases, uh, the rates are higher, and that higher rate is necessary to attract that capital from out of state into a particular market. However, the, the producers, the brokers that sell surplus lines insurance, are required to have a surplus lines license. Next. So most insurance agents and their staff, of course, must have a license. So uh, if you buy life insurance, that person has a license. They may also have a securities license if the uh, insurance product has some uh, securities features to it. Brokers, claims representatives in some states, must pass an examination and must get continuing ed credits to maintain their license. The license is used as a tool for regulators to keep track of who's doing business and as a tool for uh, disciplining people who are um, not operating as the regulations require. Next slide. Lastly, let's talk about insurance fraud. As I mentioned earlier, many people view the insurance mechanism as a source of money. They have a lot of money because they've built it up over centuries, and it's there to protect policyholders, in some cases tens of millions of policyholders, therefore the amount of money needs to be large. So people view insurance as a source of money, and people come up with ideas of how to liberate that money from the insurance companies. Next slide. Because insurance companies uh, try and by regulation are required to pay out money quickly and in good faith, it is an easy or a relatively easy crime to commit. So because of that, uh, insurance companies are expected to pay um, between 30 and 40 billion dollars uh, in uh, fraudulent claims or padded claims. And the estimate, depending on who you ask, which fluctuates, is between $400 and $700 a year per household. That's not an insignificant amount. We won't talk much about health insurance claims and waste, fraud, and abuse, but that is also an area that is of great interest to regulators 
and because it's such a large amount and causes rates to go up, regulators are very interested in it. Next slide. So as I mentioned, where does that fraud uh, materialize? It comes through false claims, that is uh, claims that for damage that didn't happen, or staged claims. There are people that uh, use it as a crime of opportunity. They have a legitimate claim, but they will add on to their claim by padding it. And finally, there are people that will misrepresent where a car is garaged or, or understate the risk and mis misrepresent the risk on the application, thereby keeping the rates lower than they otherwise would be. Next slide. So this chart shows the attitudes towards insurance fraud over time. And you'll see that roughly a quarter of people still feel that it's OK to pad your claim to recover your deductible. I've run into people who feel like they've been paying in for a long time. They have a deductible. And when a claim occurs, they don't feel like they should have to pay the deductible. So they increase the claim so that their net, clean, uh, net claims payment will cover the loss. They feel like it's a moral imperative for the insurance company to cover all of it, even though they actually have a deductible in the policy. There are other people that simply view uh, insurance as a bank. And after making all of these deposits in the form of premiums, it's time to make a withdrawal. But this, this chart shows the attitudes over time. Next slide. And you'll see that younger, younger males tend to have a more aggressive posture towards uh, padding a claim to get premiums or the deductible back. Uh, women uh, tend to be a little more uh, honest about that. And then as men age, they realize the insurance mechanism is not a source of funds, but rather a, um, a legitimate way to transfer risk when you, when you need it. Next slide. The federal government has several um, statutes to prevent racketeering or theft rings from uh, exaggerating or creating insurance claims. But in general, it's state and county prosecutors that uh, prosecute insurance fraud. Next. Um, insurance fraud is difficult to detect, but when it is detected, um, certain states have um, both reporting and immunity statutes that are designed to um, give the insurance company cover in sharing information uh, with other insurance companies or with authorities. And in some cases, they're required to provide insurance fraud statistics to the state government in hopes that that reporting will uh, improve enforcement. Next slide. Finally, we're here at the end of our presentation, but uh, a brief summary. We've talked about how rates are regulated at the state level, policy forms and what's co contained in, in the coverages and in the, in the policy itself is governed by state regulation. State regulators examine market conduct, solvency. They engage in both the licensing of insurance agents and brokers as well as who, uh, which insurance company is doing business in that state. And finally, insurance fraud is under both federal and state scrutiny, with the emphasis being on state and uh, local uh, prosecutors doing uh, most of the enforcement. I want to thank both the Griffith Foundation and CSG for inviting me to present today. And I hope that uh, today's presentation has helped enlighten you in e at least a little bit and how insurance is regulated. Dr. Russell, uh, thank you very much. It's been an informative session. I know that uh, we are up against uh, our time deadline. But uh, uh, if you would indulge us, uh, one quick question to pose to you if you're able to provide a, a brief answer. Um, insurance legislation and regulation is primarily handled at the state level. So uh, I wonder if you might take a moment or two to talk about what role, if any, the federal government plays uh, with respect to uh, regulation? Well, under the Dodd-Frank uh, Act uh, passed several years ago as a reaction to the financial crisis, the Federal Insurance Office was created 
At present, the Federal Insurance Office is only a monitoring organization. But they've begun to spar a little bit with the NAIC on how insurance should be regulated. Uh, on the uh, solvency side, uh, the Fed and the Office of the Controller of the Currency have created um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council to gauge whether or not an institution is so large that its failure would threaten the economy the so-called too big to fail. Um, AIG is one of the systemically important financial institutions designated under the FSOC framework. MetLife was also uh, judged to be that as well as Prudential. These are very large organizations in terms of assets and the FSOC viewed that their failure would create some sort of threat to financial stability. But other than those designations, which are under constant appeal and a renegotiation, uh, those designations are really the, the limit of the current federal intrusion into insurance regulation. However, as we look out several years, it would not shock me to see the Federal Insurance Office tiptoe in the direction of the NAIC and try to get a little bit more involved in insurer regulation. Understood. Uh, Dr. Russell, on behalf of our audience, uh, our friends at CSG and all of the folks here at Griffith, I thank you for sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. It's been uh, an informative session. Uh, let me now send things back to uh, Jennifer Burnett at CSG for some final thoughts from her. Hey, thanks, Frank, and, and thanks, Dr. Russell. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar will be archived in the CSG Knowledge Center. Um, you'll also be able to access the slides uh, on that page and by the Griffith Foundation. So if you missed any part of the program or you would like to recommend it to a friend, I suggest that uh, you check out our website in the next couple of days where it will be available. Uh, on behalf of the Griffith Foundation and the Council of State Governments, thanks so much for joining us today and have a good afternoon. Thanks, bye-bye.